Alrighty, for this layout update, we'll talk about building some of the new structures that make up the coal unloading area at Myrtle Place. I make some trees, and I bought some tortoise switch machines to go underneath the layout. After we cover that, I'm going to get into a bit of history about the real associated railroads and the modeled version, just so people have a better understanding of what I'm aiming at here. I think I've assumed a lot of history, but a recent encounter with a couple of fans at the hobby shop has illustrated that maybe there's a lot more I need to explain. So we'll cover all of that. Enjoy the video. See you at the end. A video or two ago, I made a comment that Myrtle Place would be a lot closer to completion if only I would get to work on the coal pile and unloader. So I got to work on it. I already knew where the rotary dump shed was going to be, so I started with that, using evergreen metal siding sheets. I had to make sure that everything is as open as possible inside the structure, so that the actual unloader will fit in when it's finally time to put that in. A bit of black paint should hide the lack of detail in the shadows for the time being. I made the roof as a separate part just in case there arose a need to pop it off, and it is now waiting for some roofing material. I also scratch built a small door on the west side of the building out of styrene and a bit of wire for the door handle. And to mount the entire structure, I added some bits of styrene square rod to the benchwork base. Now I just have to add the main doors, trim, signs, signals, and gutters, and maybe a judicious bit of weathering. Next, I turned my attention to the coal pile and conveyor which is loosely based on the unloader at the Cherokee Power Plant in Commerce City, Colorado. Since this plant converted to gas, the last of the coal was used up and actually exposed what lived under that pile and, by extension, how it worked. The conveyor was made by cutting two strips of plywood with a bit of an angle on one side and then gluing and screwing them together back to back so it formed a natural roof peak. Siding material was then laminated on using liquid nails. Similarly, the headhouse at the top of the conveyor was made out of a small wooden box, which was then laminated with siding and attached to the conveyor with a steel pin. The final styrene scratch build was a small shed where the conveyor comes out of the unloader. All of this was painted with some Model Master Desert Sand spray paint. The coal pile itself was made by making a sort of wedding cake affair out of styrofoam, which was glued together using great stuff, and then carved into a conical shape. This was then covered with Sculptamold and painted black. Later, it'll be covered with blackened white glue and dusted with some Woodland Scenics fine black cinders, which I prefer for coal, as it has that dull, flat black look to it, which is pretty typical for the coal piles I've seen around here. The other important component of this is the vertical chute, which I made out of 5 8 inch brass tube. Now, before I did anything else to it, I sharpened one end with a file and used this to cut precise holes in the foam pile base and the foam insert which holds the head house and conveyor in place. Once that was done, then I drilled and filed openings for the coal to come out of, thus creating the pile, and made little rain hoods from bits of styrene that were attached with Walther's goo. A little bit of black spray paint later, and it was good to go. Now I have to work out how I'm going to make the coal pile removable without being obvious about it. And that will just have to wait for a bit. Another thing I got busy with was making some trees. I bought a super trees kit and proceeded to make about 30 trees, as well as quite a mess. I generally followed the instructions, soaking them in the matte medium solution and then adding leaves and hanging them upside down to dry. I rigged a little clothesline in my kitchen for this purpose and used clothespins to hang them, even on both ends of the tree where necessary to keep them straight. Despite all this, some of them still came out a little bent but there are to be many more trees added, so they could be replaced or modified into some other scene. In any case, it's nice to see a bit of vertical scenery around here. Of course, it's not all visuals around here. I bought a few tortoise switch machines and started installing them based on which turnouts were the most troublesome. Basically, any place where I had to jam a toothpick into the throw rod to keep the thing in the correct position. They were installed easily enough, Though I think the next round of machines will be installed with the modules taken out and stood on end so I don't have to fish them into the throw bars while laying on the floor. For control, temporary switches were mounted to L brackets since I still don't have any Digitrax gear. So I have an idea for temporary control panels but we'll have to wait and see where that goes. 
Of course, the other important part of this installation is that I was able to test my computer power supply without cooking it, as these motors would properly load the thing when switched on. I am happy to report that the power supply and the auxiliary bus around the layout works as planned, which should give me an excuse now to go get all kinds of little accessories and other lighted things. Maybe. Anyway, that's what I've been up to for now. Thanks for watching. The actual prototype Associated Railroads of Colorado was much less a railroad than a 1942 wartime agreement to use the old Denver and Intermountain Rails between Denver and the Remington Arms Plant in Lakewood, Colorado. There were five railroads that either had direct access to the line or operated via those other roads in accordance with the other agreements. As such, the Rio Grande, Rock Island, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, Colorado and Southern, and Santa Fe each took a year in rotation to switch the arms plant traffic. The Rio Grande did a year for itself, and then a year on behalf of the Rock Island, while the Colorado and Southern did one year for itself, and then a year each for the Burlington and for joint line partner Santa Fe. After the war ended, the plant was converted to government use, becoming the Denver Federal Center, which was good for plenty of rail traffic in its own right. All of this came to an end by the 90s due to a drop in the government's use of rail shipping. The line languished for the next two decades until it was rebuilt by RTD as a light rail line. The model of this line was limited by space constraints and as such only made it as far as Lakewood. Since there was no appreciable rail traffic originating out of this area, the following fiction was created. Otto von Hartfor was a German immigrant who came to the United States in 1933 to escape the growing political turmoil in Germany. He eventually settled in Colorado with the intent of becoming a brewer, and the timing was pretty good, as Prohibition had recently ended. After some time working at the Coors Brewery in Golden, and a name change to Harper during World War II to stave off anti-German discrimination, Otto decided to start brewing more robust and flavorful beers than what were becoming typical in America. He secured a decent parcel of land that was once part of the Two Creeks Branch and named his brewery after it. The railroad built a junction off of the Denver and Intermountain near Harlan Street, which turned south short of 11th Avenue before continuing west to Salisbury Court. Thus, the brewery complex is bracketed by Lamar Street on the east and Salisbury on the west. As befits a brewery, inbound rail traffic included various grains such as barley and wheat, reefers full of hops, boxcars of cardboard and other packaging material, sand for the bottle plant, and the occasional tank car of corn syrup or other adjuncts. Yeast, by contrast, is cultured in on-site laboratories and very tightly controlled as this particular ingredient can make or break a good beer. Outbound traffic includes, of course, beer, and of course, a great deal of spent grains that were loaded into hoppers and sent to feed mills. All of this increased traffic for the brewery encouraged others to locate along the line, such as Weicker Transfer, which serves as a railhead or team track for non-rail served businesses, and as such a wide variety of cars can be unloaded onto trucks. Adjacent this is West Metro Petroleum, formerly Lakewood Fuel and Oil, which mostly deals with small-scale distribution of industrial fuels and what remains of the home heating oil business. They once did extensive coal deliveries, but after the rise of natural gas, the coal side was abandoned. This was eventually taken over by a landscaping supplier so that the dock could be used to unload bulk materials like stone, pumice, and bark. The importance of this line under these circumstances also changed how things look at Myrtle Place, the site of the original Denver and Intermountain Yard, and location of the Zunai Lacombe power plant. After the Platte River flood in 1965 damaged some coal unloading gear on the south side of the plant and washed away the railroad bridge, a new coal yard was established on the footprint of Myrtle Place and the new unloader was put on the north side. This would be a good source of revenue until the plant was converted to gas. At the same time, Colorado and Southern and other railroads involved with the Associated Railroads Agreement agreed to put together a new bridge to cross the Platte River that would be better engineered for any future flooding, though the impending construction of Chatfield Dam would eliminate any more flooding concerns. 
All of this stuff on the model takes place in a time period between 1967 and 1973. This allows me to run Burlington Northern equipment when I see fit, or I can easily backdate to pre-merger times without much trouble. The good news is that during this time period, most Colorado and Southern locomotives remained in their original pre-merger paint jobs, so I don't have to double my fleet just to flex between the eras. Some engines will simply be a bit dirtier than others, depending on the year. Anyway, that's the story of the Associated Railroads, both in its prototype form and its model form. I hope you enjoyed it. Are you not entertained? Oh, sorry. Well, I hope that clears up a lot of things. I hope you enjoyed the update. Progress is going swimmingly on the layout. So, onward to the next stages. There's plenty to do on Atlas Metals. And maybe we'll push on a little bit from there. What? Pay no attention to that. It's nothing at all. It's nothing at all. It's nothing at all.